This feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. And you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. Are you among those who are scornful of tradition? And do you decry all legend? For instance, would you belittle those who believe the deep-rooted and revered tradition in the West Country that during his boyhood Jesus came to Britain when his great-uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy merchant engaged in the tin trade, came to Cornwall and Somerset, and that therefore those wonderful words and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green may be based on truth? Have you ever really inquired deeply into the Glastonbury legends? or given much thought to the fact that it was here that the first above-ground Christian church in the world was built? We start by tracing the trade routes followed by the Phoenician merchant sailors of Tyre and Sidon when they came to Cornwall to trade for tin. In their wake came the first missionaries to Britain under Joseph of Arimathea. These conveyors of the gospel built the original wattle church in Glastonbury, so rightly known as the Jerusalem of England. And so we come to our theme. They came to a land, the appointed isles. Many hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, about the time of the greatness of Solomon, king of Israel, who reigned from 1015 to 975 BC, the power, the wealth and the influence of Phoenicia as a maritime nation was immense and had been so throughout prior centuries. From their command of the sea, the Phoenicians, stemming from among the Israelites, became the greatest seafarers of the ancient world. From Tyre and Sidon they spread westward to colonise and to trade. On the map the colonies are shaded green, mainly North Africa and southern Spain, and the trade routes are marked by red dots, hugging the North African coast and the western seaboard of Spain. The commerce of Tyre reached throughout the world, Merchants sailed the high seas far and wide and built a vast empire. The prophet Isaiah sang of them in his lamentation upon the predicted overthrow of Tyre that was yet to come and referred to the capital of Phoenicia as the crowning city whose merchants are princes, whose traffickers are the honourable of the earth. This drawing is of a relief found in the palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh depicting a Phoenician fleet of warships protecting merchant ships in 714 BC. Today, evidences of the Phoenician age are almost without trace. Therefore, we must rely not just upon relics, artefacts, ruins, but most important upon interpretation of Old Testament scripture to recall the days when, as Ezekiel puts it, thy wares went forth out of the seas, thou fillest many people. Thou didst enrich the kings of the earth with the multitude of thy riches and of thy merchandise. Long-range, deep-sea-going craft like this would be at sea for twelve months or more about the year 600 BC. They circumnavigated Africa and adventured where none had ever gone before. From the earliest times the ships of Israel sailed with the ships of Tyre, with the result that all, regardless of nationality, even the Greeks, became known as Phoenicians. These were people by no means as mysterious as they have been regarded. Indeed, they may well be placed among the great builders of our world. Today, following in the footsteps of other historicists, there are many who uphold and testify to the contention that a vast trade relationship existed between Phoenicia and Cornwall. Diodorus Siculus, who lived in the time of Augustus, BC 20, described it at length and in detail. Here, in part, is how he marked out the very sea and land routes that the Phoenicians followed. He writes, This tin metal is transported into Gaul, the merchants carrying it on horseback through the heart of Celtica to Marseille and Narbo. Posidonius, who also travelled to Britain about 80 BC, also wrote about the tin mines of Dumnonia, which is Devon, and Balerium, which is Cornwall. So there it is, long before Christ we was born, 
we find most exactly described the traditional and well-established route that some 80 years or so later was to be followed by Joseph of Arimathea and his fellow missionaries when they came to Cornwall and Somerset. The isles are far off, as Jeremiah and Isaiah put it, following the path of the trailblazing tin merchants. Contemporary literature there is in plenty to help keep alive the traditions that make Britain the first of all nations to accept Christianity as its national religion. That point we develop later, but meantime. Note how, with the lone exception of Spain, or Tarshish as it was then, the British Isles, or to be more precise, Cornwall, Devon, Somerset and the Isles of Scilly, were the only places in the world where tin and lead were obtainable. Ezekiel, when speaking to the people of Tyre, said, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches. With silver, iron, tin and lead they traded in thy fairs. King Solomon's fleet of Tarshish must have actively participated in this trade, and no doubt the bulk of the mineral riches spoken of by Ezekiel were derived from Spain and the British Isles since, being skilled in navigation, and the nautical applications of astronomy, distant voyages posed no problem for the Phoenician sailors. The caves of Hercules, layers of prehistoric man on the North African coast, perpetually pounded by Atlantic breakers, would have seen the long-range ship setting forth. Cuta, on this coastline, together with Gibraltar across the strait, formed the Greeks' mythological Pillars of Hercules, gateway to the Isles of the West. Here was the strategic throat through which flowed the seaborne traffic between Asia Minor and the world beyond the Mediterranean. This is where sea and ocean meet, the confluence of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. In the first book of Kings we find that Solomon had at sea a navy of Tarshish, where he obviously had well-established seaports, through which flowed trade from the greatest of all Phoenician colonies, Carthage. This great hub of commerce, today nothing but a ruinous heap in the suburbs of Tunis, was operated chiefly by the merchants of the trafficking city of Tyre. It was in fact from Carthage in the 5th century BC that a series of explorations was launched that are said to have included the British Isles, showing the ever westward trend of migration from Bible lands. Now an abrupt but pertinent jump in time and place. In the heart of the city of London is the Royal Exchange. Over the portico is the opening verse of the 24th Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Enter, and among the dramatic and historic incidents in our nation's life, recorded on canvases surrounding the Great Hall, is this painting executed in 1895 by Sir Frederick Leighton. Its title is wholly enthralling. It depicts, and I quote, Phoenicians trading with the early Britons on the coast of Cornwall. This reproduction affords a clearer study of the subject matter and it helps to sharpen the detail. Among their wares they brought a most sought after export, the Tyrian purple dyed cloth to barter for tin, the metal utterly essential in the making of bronze. At this point it is worth remembering that the Greek historian Herodotus, writing in the 5th century BC, made reference to the metal trade which existed with these islands, calling them the Cassiterides, the tin islands. Cassiterite is a native tin-bearing stone. So now our story brings us to the shores of Beleriam, the Cornish peninsula where the Hebrew merchants bartered on the beaches for the crudely smelted ingots. Today the county is profusely studded with the gaunt granite engine houses, the crumbling brick stacks and the ruined calciners the overgrown ruins of a hundred years or more. The remains and debris of an industry having its roots in biblical antiquity. The fact that tin was sought after literally thousands of years ago is supported by the certainty that Cornwall, being so richly endowed in the mineral, became longest and more intensively mined than any other in Britain, in fact than in most of Europe. It should, however, be borne in mind that whilst the early Britons may very well have dug for it, true vein or load mining, that is to say the sinking of pits and shafts, did not commence until the Middle Ages, 
so tin would have been obtained mainly by streaming. Here you can see tin as it would have been panned out of the river beds and estuaries by the early prospectors. Alluvial deposits washed down by the rivers in spate were plentiful in such lovely rivers as the Dart, the name Dart being a Britonic Celtic word meaning oak stream, and in the valley bottoms of the Foy, which in turn is a Celtic word meaning beach river, and wherever rivers have their water shed into the sea, such as the Tamar, which forms the county's eastern boundary and was once a river port well over a thousand years ago. Ancient quays once penetrated the reaches of the river here at Moor Wellham. The deserted stream works which once existed here were known by the labourers of a century ago as Atal Saracen. Atal is an early Cornish word meaning remains. The name Saracen after the nomadic people of the Syrio-Arabian desert. Here is a relic from those days, the St Moore's Tin Ingot in Truro Museum Cornwall, dredged up from the Fall Estuary in 1812. It weighs 158 pounds more than the weight of an 11 stone man. Its description in the showcase says that it is pre-Roman and that no European ingot datable to the Roman period or later is known to have had this shape. It goes on to say that Diodorus Siculus supports this when, in or around 50 BC, he wrote, saying that the tinners of Valerium smelt and purify the tin and beat the mess metal into masses shaped like astragali and carried them to a certain island lying off Britain called Ictis, most probably St Michael's Mount. During the ebb of the tide, the intervening space is left dry and they carry over into this island the tin in abundance in their wagons. Here the merchants buy the tin, and it is then carried over to Gaul, and after travelling overland for about 30 days, finally they bring their loads on horses to the mouth of the Rhone, evidently to the city of Massilia, founded by the Greeks and which today we know as Marseille. One further look at the ingot, and a comment on the shape describing word astragali. Astragalos is the Greek word for knuckle bone and metal cast in this shape made it easy for two men to carry by hand and facilitated portage and loading when strapped to pack animals. Ingots are still being found. These roughly shaped blocks of tin were discovered in 1974 at Pra Sands, less than 20 miles from Land's End. There seems no doubt that they are from the same period. Are we not now entitled to consider these early Britons in the light of what Camden tells us in the first volume of his Britannia, published in 1806, concerning the Israelitish tribe of Asher, which stemmed from the eighth son of Jacob. He comes out boldly with the statement, and I quote, The merchants of Asher worked the tin mines, not as slaves, but as masters and exporters. Unquote. So it is upon the sure foundation of the well-established and frequented tin trade route between Phoenicia and Britain, that we ally the centuries-old traditions and legends deeply rooted in Cornwall and Somerset, based upon well-documented fact that Joseph of Arimathea, himself a decurion of the Roman Empire, a member of a provincial senate, and a wealthy merchant in the tin trade came to these islands. So now let's travel through the West Country, starting with a visit to the Roseland district of Cornwall. There is Falmouth on the left with St Moors the other side of the Fal estuary. On this slide, a rainbow conveniently indicates the neighbourhood where the ingot was found. We are standing on the heights of St Anthony in Roseland. The rose in the name is really a corruption of the Celtic word ross, meaning well-watered promontory. On the Ordnance Survey map, the most notable landmark on the St Anthony headland is Place, with its Celtic priory and church founded in the 9th or 10th century. The manor house is now an hotel. One hundred years ago this was how it looked, tucked away among the trees by the waters of Amsterdam Bay, and said to have been a safe haven for the tin trading ships from Phoenicia. This fine old building is just one of many places where legends concerning the coming of Joseph of Arimathea and the boy Jesus are to be found. Firstly, we pause at the St Anthony Church to say that the period we will be concerning ourselves with from now on is AD 13 to AD 63, 
which embraces within it the unrecorded 18 years in the boyhood and young manhood of our Lord between the ages of 12 and 30. When we recall the account of the finding of the Saviour in the temple in Jerusalem, as depicted in Holman Hunt's beautiful painting, we begin to border upon the missing years, as they are called. If, as a boy, our Lord was brought on one of Joseph of Arimathea's voyages, then there would be logical reason for this. Most authorities agree that Jesus' mother became widowed while our Lord was still young. And according to law, guardianship of a fatherless son devolved upon an uncle. And was not Joseph great-uncle to Jesus? This fact would provide a simple explanation, and then consider this thought. Is it not amazing that a boy of twelve should be addressing the elders in the temple, bearing in mind that if any youths of this age were still living, they would obviously have escaped the slaughter by Herod of all the children from two years old and under that were in Bethlehem and the surrounding country. For a moment, let us see the site of the synagogue at Capernaum, beside the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus preached during his ministry. This is how it appears today. The doom pronounced upon it is reflected in its ruin. But look at this stone, the base of a fallen pillar, on it is carved the image of the Ark of the Covenant. Ever since the time that Moses hewed the commandments on the two tablets of stone on Mount Sinai, historic pronouncements have been engraved on stone. An extremely ancient cryptic script used by the early British was the Ogham alphabet, composed of thin strokes grouped above, below and across a horizontal line. This is the Fardel stone in the British Museum. It was discovered at Cadley, near Ivy Bridge in South Devon, where it had served as a footbridge on a farm. The carved strokes of Ogham writing are also engraved on a panel inscription in the monastery church at Place, St Anthony in Roseland. In this booklet photograph of it, we are invited to try and see traces of similar Ogham lettering which has been interpreted as saying, Jesus the carpenter came here for tin. Other obscure outlines are alleged to be symbols representing a fish, a ship, and our Lord's head. This legend of Jesus having come to Cornwall has also found its way onto the stonework over the south door of the monastery church. The ancient pictographs forming the arch are said to be over a thousand years old. A detail of the arch shows the lamb and cross symbol used today in the heraldry of Cornwall and Somerset. Two of the abstracts are carved in the frieze representing two thorns and two palms, and to the right a symbolic church, a microcosm of our Lord's life. We go north now to St Justin, Roseland, where even stronger allegiance to the legend is to be detected, even to the point of rivalry. With characteristic Celtic reserve, the Cornish folk become tight-lipped if they detect any stranger scorning their persistent traditions. They are highly sensitive to ridicule. But, as soon as one sees the exquisite beauty of St Just Church, founded in AD 550, lapped by the waters of the creek and set amid a wealth of subtropical foliage, then the mind is made receptive to the claim of their own particular legend that here is secreted the stone on which Christ stepped when he landed. What kind of person would dare to suggest that legend has no relationship with fact, nor tradition any relevance to truth? Among the gravestones, themselves buried in centuries of overgrowth, are two wells. One is the Holy Well and Stone Chair of St Moore's, and the other they call the Christening Well. The banks and gullies run with crystal clear water. It leaks out of every slope in the ground. It was in 1932, when a culvert became blocked, that they came across the stone in this cavity, and which became revered as that upon which Jesus stepped. Not in itself a very old legend but nobody feels inclined to question what the curious but unintelligible markings on it might be. And in any case, its finding only impinged itself upon an already existing legend that goes back into the mists of time. But now we must tread upon firmer ground, and it is to the very cradle of English Christianity that we now turn, to Glastonbury, the Isle of Avalon, where firmly established legend, ingrained tradition, 
and recorded history combine to provide us with what many accept as part of a literal outworking of biblical prophecy concerning the Isles of the West. Were it possible to look at a map of this area of Somerset before and during the first century Anno Domini, we would have seen a very different coastline between the Quantocks and the Mendips. The waters of the Bristol Channel penetrated deep inland, filling the low-lying moorland areas of Godney, Birtle and King Sedgemoor to Glastonbury and beyond. Certainly flood tides came in as far as Glastonbury as recently as 1811 and on the wall of St. Benedict's Church in the town there was, until recently when it was stolen, a high tide watermark. A painting especially commissioned for this study provides an artistic concept of how one might have expected to see the Tor and the Wirral, also to become known as Weary All Hill, forming the centre of an island. In ancient records we find Glastonbury called Innes Vitrin, the glassy island, and later, because of the wild apples which grew in profusion, it was named the Isle of Avalon, from the word Avalar, meaning an apple. Today, as one looks across from Mount Avalon towards Weiriel Hill, morning mists help one to visualise the areas of marshland and the people who live there. And just outside Glastonbury are the sites of two lake villages, one at Mere and the other at Godney. The word means Godmarsh Island. They date from about 300 BC. Excavations give us clues as to the kind of settlements these were. The wattle and daub huts, the ones in the photograph are of course museum miniatures, would surely have been the kind of dwellings that Joseph and his fellow missionaries would have built for themselves when, about the year AD 36, Joseph and his companions came to Britain by way of Gaul to preach the gospel. Surely it is reasonable to assume that this kind of structure built from indigenous materials, would have been adopted by the men from Palestine. Remember, we are now thinking of the period after the crucifixion and resurrection, when the first ever above-ground Christian church, made of wattle and daub, was about to be built. Now let's go to some other places where, as St Luke once said, the very stones would cry out, were they to be silent about their traditions. This modest stream flows through Pilton, six miles east of Glastonbury and almost alongside the parish church. Here we are made impressively aware of the story of our Lord's traditional visit as a boy. Firstly, read what the notice in the church has to say. Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy metal merchant, first traded here for lead and copper from pretty and green ore in the Mendips. Green ore. What an obvious name to give to a copper mining town, and it's still there just three miles north of Wells. Whilst tin would have been unloaded at Cornish ports, lead and copper would have been shipped out from Pilton Harbour when the landlocked village, which is now 20 miles from the nearest sea, had a wharf. Indeed, on the pulpit in the church there is an anchor boldly carved upon it, and despite the willful damage done by vandals, we see in this carving recognition that at one time Pilton had a waterfront and an anchorage for boats. And on its banner we see Joseph, having recently we might presume become guardian of the boy Jesus and brought him on one of his journeys, bringing him by boat, having made their way up from the channel, the Bristol Channel, to Godney and on to Pilton. The other occupant we might assume to be one of Joseph's merchant seamen. How appropriate at this moment to recall the inspiring words of the Glastonbury hymn Jerusalem, written 165 years ago by the artist and poet William Blake. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the Holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? The head of Christ in manhood. This beautiful window in Pilton Church reminds us again of the unrecorded years and poses afresh the questions. Might not Jesus have spent some time in Britain prior to his ministry? And why, considering the shattering impact of his crucifixion, is there no record or recollection of him living in Palestine for those 18 years from 12 to the age of 30? Pilton is a good example by which to illustrate the theological meaning of the word tradition. Consult a dictionary. By definition it is doctrine held by generation after generation to have divine authority but not originally committed to writing. 
And were you to linger in the village of Priddy, this is its church, lying at the top of the Mendip Hills, where the lead and copper mines continued to be worked without a break for long after the Romans came to the west of the Isles, you would likely hear the age-old proverb that still lingers on, as sure as our Lord was at Priddy. We look down now upon the Vale of Avalon and the prominence known as Weary All Hill, an anglicised version of the word Wirral, which in turn stems from a Celtic term meaning men of Israel, which the Druids gave to Joseph and his followers. It is here that we recall the legend associated with it. Following the crucifixion and resurrection, Joseph and his party set sail for the British island of Innisfitran, later to be known by its English name Glastonbury. Bringing their craft to anchor alongside the island, Joseph ascended the hill and thrust his staff into the ground, an ancient form of claim to land. The thorn staff, like the rod given by Moses to Aaron, about which one reads in the book of Numbers, chapter 17, verses 1 to 11, took root and eventually grew into a beautiful tree, becoming widely known as the sacred thorn. At the base of the sprouting stump of the original tree there is a stone slab, it is said that it marks the location of the thorn into which the staff grew and which was partly destroyed in the 16th century. In 1801 a certain John Clark put a monumental slab on the spot but he had it inscribed with the inaccurate date of AD 31 as the year of Joseph's coming. There are a number of well-established thorn trees growing in Glastonbury and this one is alongside St Patrick's Chapel in the Abbey Grounds. The botanical name for the Levantine thorn is Craterus monogena praecox, and the Arimathean legend surrounding it is recognised by the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew in their literature pertaining to it. At Christmas, when the thorn has never failed to flower, a custom going back many centuries is observed. The mayor, who on this occasion was Councillor Edith Rice, cuts a sprig to send to Her Majesty the Queen. The cutting is then packaged and mailed to Buckingham Palace. Progeny of the original Joseph staff from well before the reign of Charles I have, down through the centuries, provided this fragrant link between the founder of the Christian faith in Britain and the monarchy. The planting of commemorative trees has indeed been a custom since time immemorial, and to the northeast of the Tor one can see the famous Oaks of Avalon, the most ancient and massive of these came to be known as Gog and Magog. It has been estimated that they must have been growing when Joseph came to preach the gospel and convert the early Britons. The Tor is the town's most famous landmark. At its summit is St Michael's Tower. The church is recorded as having been thrown down by an earthquake in 1275. The processional ways of the Druids are clearly visible whilst at its foot is the chalice well which we will see in a moment. But firstly, <clears throat> let's dwell upon some factual evidence that anyone in London could check up on. When the Arimathean party of Christian Israelites arrived in Glastonbury, they were received as Judean refugees. King Aviragus rewarded their courteous behaviour by bestowing upon them twelve hides of land. A hide equals 160 acres, free of tax. In the public record office in London may be seen the two volumes of the Domesday Book of 1086. This survey of England was carried out by officials of William the Conqueror and the name is derived from the belief that its judgment was as final as Doomsday. Here on this page in volume 1, folio 90, is the irrefutable proof of those twelve hides. That this grant should have remained inviolate for over a thousand years is a strong witness to the coming of Joseph to Glastonbury. And if for confirmation we turn to another reliable source, then, by permission of the Master and Fellows of Trinity College, Cambridge, we are able to show you pages from the chronicles of the eminent 12th century British historian William of Malmesbury, a man noted for the accuracy of his work. In the year 1126, this is part of what he wrote. In the year of our Lord 36, twelve holy missionaries, with Joseph of Arimathea at their head, came over to Britain, preaching the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Being pleased with their soberness of life and exceptional behaviour, the king, at their petition,
gave them for their habitation a certain island, bordering on this region covered with trees and bramble bushes, surrounded by marshes and called Innisvitran. These holy men, thus dwelling in this desert place, built a chapel of the form of that which had been shown them. The walls were of osiers wattled together. This was finished in the one and thirtieth year, that's AD 64, after our Lord's Passion, and though rude and misshapen in form, was in many ways adorned with heavenly virtues. Now, if for a moment we return to Pilton Church, there beside the graveyard is a stone, which with good authority we can say marked an old boundary of one of the hides mentioned by Malmesbury and recorded in the Domesday Book. And another stone marker of considerable significance can be seen on the roadside at Haviot between Glastonbury and Pilton. On it are these words. This is the site of Pontus Vallum, the fort of the bridge which defended the Isle of Avalon from the mainland. This ancient British rampart, now called Pontus Ball, is another proof of Glastonbury having at one time been surrounded by water. In this terraced garden is where we find the chalice well, bespeaking the cup of the Last Supper which Joseph is said to have brought with him. Inside the well are two chambers, built of massive stones put together in wedge formation, which the celebrated Egyptologist Sir Flinders Petrie said is identical in structure to those found in Egypt. There are many, colourful and undoubtedly picturesque legends, mostly born of romanticism or visionary fervour, surrounding the well and the concealment of the cup within it. But these may stem from the fact that the chally beet spring water is known to possess curative properties. When one reflects upon the vast train of evidence that leads to the Abbey, there is no wonder that Glastonbury is referred to as the English Jerusalem. In a letter to Pope Gregory, written in AD 600, St Augustine said, In the western confines of Britain, there is a certain royal island of large extent, surrounded by water, abounding in all the beauties of nature and necessities of life. In it, the first neophytes, that is to say, converts to Christianity, found a church constructed by no human art, but by the hand of Christ himself for the salvation of his people. It was on May the 25th, 1184, that the whole of the Monastery Abbey, consisting of the two churches of St. Joseph and St. Peter and Paul, with cloisters, chapter house, scriptorium and school, was consumed by fire, going with it every book and document in the library that would have removed for all time the queries and doubts that now inhibit oral tradition and sometimes, sometimes cast suspicion on most trustworthy successors. But to return to St. Joseph's Chapel, it was right here on this holiest earth of all England, as it is rightfully called, that sometime between AD 37 and 63, the original Wattle Church was built. This Norman church now occupies the site of the first known above-ground church in the world. Since the 12th century, it has also been known as St. Mary's Church. Hence the names Jesus and Maria to be seen engraved in dedication upon the southern wall of the chapel. Of all the ruins in the abbey grounds, this is the most important. The most remarkable feature of the Glastonbury buildings is this continued representation of the wooden church of the Britons by the chapel of St. Joseph. Through all the ages, since the Wattle Church was first erected, and through all the vicissitudes affecting the later buildings of the Abbey, the approximate size and shape of the first British church to proclaim the gospel in our island have been religiously maintained. Its dimensions match those of the tabernacle, as described in the book of Exodus. There is nothing corresponding to this to be found in Christendom, the rise and foundation of all religion in Britain. In microcosm, Glastonbury's great glory. Its supremacy stems from its associations with first-generation gospel messengers. It also became the burying place of its founders, Israelites indeed. The evidence is now too strongly established to be brushed aside, as it has been in the past, as fanciful or as monkish fable. To our shame, it has long been popular to diminish tradition and to decry all legend. 
In Glastonbury's own parish church, St John Baptist, another window and another witness. Look closely at just two divisions depicting incidents in the life of Joseph having bearing on Glastonbury's history. Here we see Joseph at the entombment of our Lord following the crucifixion. As next of kin, he had the right to claim the body of his master for burial within his own sepulchre. Though opinions may differ, and divergence of belief does exist, this is recognised by many to be Joseph of Arimathea's tomb in Jerusalem outside the original walls. In the Magdalen College Library, Oxford, there is an ancient manuscript containing a detailed description of the mausoleum and sepulchre that Joseph had made for his own interment, but in which he laid the body of Jesus. It is described as, as consisting of two chambers, a spacious and lofty room, and an inner chamber wherein the body would have been laid. Both entrances are said to have faced eastwards. The year of the crucifixion was AD 33. Then, in another panel of the window, we see depicted Joseph planting his staff on Weary All Hill. Seemingly, it is a Viragus looking on the king who gave the missionaries the twelve hides of land. Joseph was buried in the Wattle Church. His remains, exhumed by Edward III in 1345, were centuries later laid to rest in a tomb. This, by tradition, is that tomb. To quote Melguin of Landaff, writing in AD 540, Joseph received his everlasting rest with his eleven associates in the Isle of Avalon. Is it not a source of inspiration to think that here in the Isles of the West we have deeply entrenched and revered traditions that radiate from the hallowed land on which once stood a simple wattle church. The aspect of the Celt is terrifying. They are very tall in stature with rippling muscles and a clear white skin. Their hair is blonde and thick and shaggy like a horse's mane. They wear brightly coloured and embroidered shirts with striped and checkered cloaks fastened at the shoulders with a golden brooch. Odyssey I was tall, terrible to look upon, and was gifted with a powerful voice. A great mass of the tawniest hair fell to her hips, and she wore a golden necklace and a multicoloured robe. Over it a thick cloak held together by a brooch, and she carried a long spear. When she rode into battle, she wore a great twisted golden ornament. Her daughters might very well have worn bracelets such as these of pure gold on their wrists. The stature of the Celts and their beauty and their prowess in war may easily be discerned and they had a lively sense of justice and honesty. The Celtic cavalry always frightened the Romans more than the infantry an important component of their tactics was the advance, yelling and making much noise using mounted spear and javelin throwers. They had a preference for great mobility, rapid attack with the hope of a quick victory. But finally, at Maiden Castle in Dorset, they were overwhelmed by the superior military tactics and battle experience of the Roman legions. The Celts were proud and arrogant and were easily provoked. 
but they were also artistic and loved music. And when dancing, the girls held hands with the men. They preferred large quantities of beer rather than wine, but they would drink anything alcoholic. The Celts lived well in large, warm and remarkably strong circular huts. This reconstruction of a Celtic hut, 42 feet in diameter, has been built at the Butzer Hill Ancient Farm Project in Hampshire. Smoke from the cooking hearth would have percolated through the roof thatching, killing insects and cleaning the straw. There would have been an upper floor in which they slept and game and meat and timber would have hung in the apex of the roof to season. At their frequent feasts, the company sat in a circle, their positions according to rank and prowess. And the evening's entertainments often included all in wrestling. And nearly always, a bard sang the praises of the host. In times of danger, the Celts relied on their women as strong comrades in arms. A whole host of enemy warriors could not withstand a single Celt if he had his wife to aid him. As a rule, she is blue-eyed, blonde and quite terrifying. If she were to strike out and kick, it would be as if a catapult had shot out four missiles at one time. In 1886, the archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans elevated the Celts from woad painted savages to dignified and artistic people, whose skill in designing such artifacts as the Battersea Shield prompted Sir Arthur to describe the Celts as this elegant, exotic race. Enlarged on the right of the picture is the central boss of the shield. The Desborough mirror shows grace and beauty of design as accomplished as any produced by the best of 20th century artists. That a people who could produce such elegant and artistic artifacts could ever have been described as painted savages is beyond belief. It was upon this people that a great light was to shine. This is the Scotland that tourists know so well, that lovely, rugged country of highlands and islands which has inspired so many writers, poets, artists and musicians. But many centuries ago, it was a very different Scotland. To the southerner, it was an unknown land of strange, painted people, the Picts. Their enigmatic carvings are still not fully understood today. Contrary to well-established tradition, the Picts were not low-browed Neanderthal-type savages as sometimes portrayed in television cartoons, but were an intelligent pastoral people to whom the message of the gospel, as lived and taught by St. Ninian and his monks, appealed strongly. Upon the early non-Christian animal outlines drawn and carved with a remarkable economy of line, the emblem of the Christian faith became dominant. One might well quote from the book of Isaiah, the people that walked in darkness. Not the long cold darkness of the winter months in the far north, but a darkness of the soul, until the influence of St. Ninian brought them a new light. While far away to the southwest of these Britannic Isles, another light was to illuminate the Celtic fringe. Contrary to the usually accepted belief, the Christian faith arrived in these islands in the first half of the first century, long before St. Augustine's mission to Kent in 597 AD. Many ancient writers point to Britain as being the first land to receive the message of Christ outside Palestine.
Glastonbury Abbey precincts have been described by some medieval writers and chroniclers as the holiest earth of England. The tradition, believed by many, is that not long after the resurrection of our Lord, a band of followers of the way, as the first Christians were called, led by Joseph of Arimathea, came to this part of Somerset to build the first above-ground Christian church in the world, where now stands the ruins of St. Joseph's Chapel. it is believed stood the simple wattle and daub structure which, together with the abbey, its precious library of books and the old wooden church, were all destroyed in the great fire in the 12th century. And so it was that 500 years before Pope Gregory sent Augustine and Romanized Christianity to England, the true faith had touched and taken root in the Celtic West. It was to touch and illuminate the life of a young man born and brought up in a Romano-British household somewhere in South Wales, it is believed. When still a young man, he was abducted by roving Irish pirates. His name was Patrick. He was taken to Ulster and there sold to one Milliuk in County Antrim where he remained for six years guarding the farmer's flocks of pigs on the slopes of Sleamish Mountain. One day, while keeping his solitary vigil, the light of Christ entered his soul. Many years later, after an adventurous life, Patrick was to spread the Christian gospel to all who would listen, even to the high kings of Ireland. Patrick was of the original Celtic or Chaldee church from whence issued the true and unadulterated message originally planted at Glastonbury and which later was to blossom in the Isles of Iona and Lindisfarne. One has only to read through Patrick's letters and confessions to note that there is no hint of any Roman dogma there. Indeed, they might have been written by any of the four Gospelers, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. The torch was taken up by a brilliant, aggressive and somewhat forceful member of an Irish aristocratic family from the far west of Ireland. His name was Colum, Latinized to Columba. The Donegal village of Glen Columkeel is named after him, and in and around the village the ancient ones set up marker and commemorative stones predating Christianity by a thousand years or more and upon which the cross of Christ was superimposed, the design showing more clearly on a reconstructed imitation in Glen Columkeel's Folk Museum and at the village crossroads. The Christian cross shows clearly. Columba was a great scholar and was especially gifted in copying and illuminating the scriptures. In the days before printing, these copies were exceedingly valuable, and Columba took them with him on his many missionary journeys. At one time, Columba visited his old tutor, St. Finian, and was evidently so taken with a copy of a Latin Psalter that he asked if he might borrow it. However, without asking Finian's permission, he copied it. It seemed that the copyright rule applied even in those early days. St. Finian, after many requests to Columba to return the Psalter, was unable to get the book back. So, as a last resort, he appealed to King Diarmid, a relative of Columba, to apply a little pressure. But even this failed, and this simple happening started a small local war in which many some say 3,000 were killed. A rapidly convened council met which banished Columba from Ireland until, as was promulgated by the council, Columba had won from the heathen as many souls for Christ as would replace the number killed through his sin. 
hardly an auspicious start to a saintly life. So in 563 AD, Columba and some of his followers built a seagoing Karach and putting out from Derry weathered the stormy North Channel and keeping to the lee of the islands made their way northwards. No doubt many a fervent prayer was offered up for a safe landfall. Crossing the last stretch of open water, they made for the south coast of Mull and eventually landed on this beach at the southernmost end of the little island of Hai, or Iona, as it is now called. And after prayers were said for a safe landing, Columbus soon had everyone working, whether they liked it or not, and the foundations for the first primitive monastery were laid. In 1963, some hardy members of the Church of Ireland recreated this epic voyage by building a replica of Columbus Carach, sailing and rowing across the North Channel, never calm at the best of times. Although, unlike Columba, who island hopped up the east side of Isla, due to an east wind, they made their way to Iona up the west coast, then to the east of Colonsay, and so to the white sands of Iona, where they were met by the Archbishop of Canterbury and a great crowd of onlookers. Columbo soon had the entire island organised and started to instruct the somewhat dazed inhabitants in the best methods of fishing, farming and clothing themselves, which one assumes they had already been doing quite satisfactorily for generations past. He stayed on the island for two years, then set out on his missionary journeys, first to the Picts in the far north, then a journey of some danger, and converted King Bruder of Inverness to Christianity. After some years of travel in these somewhat hazardous areas, Columba returned to Iona, and when, as an old man, he knew that his time was come, asked to be carried to the steps of the altar in the church so that he might die with his head resting on Jacob's stone of Bethel, which many believe to be one and the same with a coronation stone in Westminster Abbey. Before he died, Columba made this prophecy. Unto this place, small and mean though it be, great homage shall yet be paid not only by the kings and people of the Scots, but by rulers of foreign and barbarous nations and their subjects. In great veneration, too, shall it be held by holy men of other churches. Columba died at the age of 77, and in that same year, St. Augustine landed in Kent to bring Romanized Christianity to southeast England. Columbus monks celebrated a different date for Easter, and this soon proved to be a major stumbling block to the Church of Rome. The Celtic tonsure consisted of a semicircle of hair at the front and long tresses at the back, all of which was a special mark of resistance to Rome, a mark of defiance. In his lifetime, the Celtic Church played a considerable part in preserving and developing Christian culture in the Western world at a time when the continent of Europe was little more than a confusion of self-seeking nations. The Irish monasteries of Cashel, Clonard and Kells, and of Lindisfarne and Iona, were great spiritual and intellectual centres, sending Christian missionaries far afield, some even as far as the Ukraine, Russia. The old stone church built by St. Columba has given way to the reconstructed abbey of the Iona community, strangely in accordance with Columba's prophecy, in Iona of my heart, Iona of my love. Instead of monks' voices shall be lowing of cattle. But ere the world comes to an end, Iona shall be as it was. Outside the abbey stands one of the beautiful and elegant crosses, the St. John's Cross, one of many marking the path of those early Celtic Chaldee missionaries. In such reverence was this little island held 
that 48 Scottish, Saxon and Norwegian kings gave instructions that they were to be interred beneath these grey granite grave covers, most of which are now on view in the Abbey Museum. Some of these grave covers are finely carved with representations of the interred royalty. The monks in these western islands were called Chaldees, a faith which had some affinity with the Druids. There are many circumstances connected with the Chaldees to indicate that their doctrine retained a large measure of Druidical philosophy, a philosophy far removed from the blood-drenched ceremonies of popular imagination in connection with Stonehenge. These island Druids were Christianized and all their power and influence they ascribed to Christ. In Columba's own words, Christ is my Druid. The faith of the Chaldees was a pure faith, free from the corrupt practices and doctrines of the Church of Rome. They owned no rule but the word of God. They had no worship of saints or angels, no prayers for the dead, no confession to a priest, no elevation of Mary, the mother of Jesus. They hoped for salvation from the mercy of God alone through faith in Jesus Christ. And they had no bishops or prelates. Their sole church office bearers were ministers and elders. The purity and simplicity of this Christian doctrine as professed and taught by the Chaldees appears to have been in full harmony with their character, habits and mode of life. Their faith had little or no connection with that of Rome. And when doctrine and ceremonial began to increase, Rome found in the Chaldees their most determined opponents. According to the Venerable Bede, these Chaldees only practiced such works of charity and piety as they could learn from the prophetical and apostolic writings of the Bible, which they illustrated with superb skill and artistry, as in this page from the Book of Kells. This strict adherence to the written word of Scripture and their complete and utter abhorrence of all other authorities was the main cause of their subsequent downfall, as we shall see later. The Chaldees did not adopt the corruptions and superstitions which had been contaminating Christianity for centuries, and they continued to teach the simple faith until later monks arose who were as inferior to them in learning as they surpassed them in wealth and complex ceremonies by which means they captivated the eye and infatuated the mind. Rome, by force, by cunning and seduction of every kind, by degrees bereft them of their ancient purity of religion. The Chaldees were, from Augustine's day, in constant collision with Rome. They seem to have been too much in love with the simple Bible truth to find favor with those who aimed at wealth and power. The clergy of the Papal Church were almost wholly employed in metaphysical and chronological disputes, along with the discussion of martyrologies, a sad contrast to the pure spiritual dissemination of the gospel by the ancient British church, the Chaldees, who had introduced into northern Britain the knowledge of the gospels, and for centuries after the domination of Rome continued to hold services. Corruption of the faith was ruthlessly stamped out by the firmness of the senior clergy, they had great missionary zeal, and large numbers of them went out to Christianize much of Europe, from Iceland to the Danube. This is a fact of history which has been very diligently suppressed. The Celtic monks were no escapists. Indeed, they were so aware of the splendor of life that they grudged each moment wasted in sleep. We can see the boundless reserves of energy and patience in the spiral and interlacing designs on stone and in metal, and in their exquisitely written manuscripts. Being both physical and spiritual athletes, they must have been good to look upon, their thin, rugged faces alive with humorous, intelligent eyes. Their hands were strong, yet very gentle with bird, beast or child, and skillful almost beyond belief 
with a fine quill pen. No Celtic monk ever travelled without a stout walking stick or staff, and from his shoulders hung a leather satchel containing his precious books. So many Celtic monks were fishermen, carpenters or farmers. Some were shepherds. That the outdoor atmosphere of the gospel story fitted marvellously into their daily lives. Only men of perfect physique could have survived the life of toil, privation and long hours which were spent in prayer. St. Columba is usually thought of as the first to spread the Christian message in the north, due perhaps to his forceful personality. But much of the ground was prepared for him by St. Ninian, who built a little stone church here on the southern coast of Dumfries and Galloway at Whithorn. Bede, our oldest authority, wrote that the Picts, renouncing idolatry, accepted the true faith as taught by the Chaldees and preached by Ninian. Bede describes him as a most reverent and holy man of the British race. Ninian was the son of a British chieftain and was educated on the continent. He stayed for a time with St. Martin of Tours, who later sent his own stonemasons to Ninian to help him build his church which used light-coloured stone, which gave the name to the place, White House, in the Latin, Candida Casa. White House then became Whithorn. The later monastery, built on the site of the original Celtic church, became a famous seat of learning known throughout the Celtic world. Scholars from Ireland came here in the 5th and 6th centuries, and monks from Whithorn went as missionaries to the remotest parts of Scotland. A 7th century incised stone with the Latin words the place of Peter the Apostle suggests an intriguing mystery. Just as tradition has Joseph of Arimathea buried at Glastonbury, perhaps this stone suggests that far from St Peter's remains resting beneath the Vatican, he might have been interred here, far from the sunny skies of Italy. Or was this another Peter, also an apostle? A little chapel dating from the 13th century stands on a promontory to the south of the village, a welcome house of prayer to those coming ashore. This is a 5th century Christian marker stone from the Kirkmadrine area in Galloway and embodies the Greek letters Chi and Rho, the first two letters of the word Christ. It carries also the names of three Christian priests. Here lie the holy and chief priests Edes, Viventius and Morvorius. This is the oldest memorial stone in Scotland and dates from the middle of the 5th century. The roughly carved Latin epitaph reads, We praise thee, Lord Latinus, aged 35, and his daughter, aged 4. The grandson, Beravadus, set up the monument here. In the little parish church at Ruthwell, Dumfriesshire, is the beautiful 7th century Ruthwell Cross, a unique example of artistic excellence, probably the finest on Scottish soil. At the foot of the cross, Mary is anointing the feet of Christ. The beauty and simplicity of line would equal any classical statuary, and there are still those who would maintain that our ancient ancestors in these islands were primitives. Vikings plundered the monasteries time and time again, and their priceless libraries or famous books were burnt. The loss of these superb works of art is inestimable. Yet, strangely enough, for these violent people, many readily accepted the Christian faith, settled in Britain and forgot their Norse gods. Despite Viking raids, 
Celtic Christian missionaries with great courage carried the gospel as far as the Orkneys, the Shetland Islands, and even right into Viking lands. One can judge the fear of the Vikings from a short poem penned by one of the monks. The bitter wind is high tonight, it lifts the white locks of the sea. In such wild storm, no fright of savage Viking troubles me. Through raid after raid on Iona, the Scottish monks clung to the remains of their beloved Columba, but in 831 they had to send it for safekeeping back to Ireland, where it is believed to have been interred together with the bones of St. Patrick in his grave at Downpatrick, County Down. Of all the influences which moulded Celtic society, none had greater impact than the Celtic faith the lives of the Celtic saints embody all the virtues of the pastoral side of the church. The image of the gentle hermit disdaining all possessions and living a life devoted to God in a humble cell is one of the most powerful in the history of the church. The early saints attained what later mystics sought, the theme of the simple man whose humility and integrity shows through the somewhat fanciful accounts of their later imaginative biographers. One such biographer, St. Adam Nunn, who wrote St. Columba's life, became an ardent follower of Rome and eventually convinced the British church of Strathclyde to follow Roman practices in 688 AD. However, monks from Iona still continued to resist Rome until 729, but it was a losing fight. Rome was to gain ascendancy in the end, for a time. In 625 AD, King Oswe was sent as a boy to Iona to learn from the monks and thus received a grounding in the simple Chaldee faith. Later, he decided to use his military might to put an end to the cruelty of King Cadwalla of Northumbria. In a major battle at Heavenfield, Cadwalla was killed and Oswe sent to Iona for monks to help him Christianize Northumbria. There arrived St. Aidan, who decided to construct a monastery on Holy Island or Lindisfarne, and so successful was this religious institution that it succeeded in Christianizing Mercia Essex and later Sussex. However, there were major differences between the Celtic and the Roman churches which were causing such a rift that the whole structure of the Christian church was endangered. Thus, King Oswe called a meeting in the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria at Whitby in 662 in order to decide once and for all whether to follow the Celtic or the Roman way. This meeting marked a vital turning point in the development of the British church. King Oswe himself founded the abbey at Whitby in memory of his victory over the pagan king Penda of Mercia. Although Northumbria had been mainly converted by the Celtic missionaries to accept the simple gospel of Christ, there was also a growing Roman Catholic party, which included amongst its supporters members of the royal houses, but especially a young priest named Wilfred, to whom nothing mattered but the advancement of the Roman cause. The abbess Hilda and bishops Colman and Ked led the Celtic party, oblivious of Wilfred's taunts about Picts and Britons who foolishly in these two small islands do oppose all the rest of the universe The main purpose of the Synod of Whitby was in fact an excellent one, to find out the truest tradition of Easter, that all might then follow the one path. However, Wilfred put forward such a seemingly uncontestable statement that it was St. Peter who had the keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, and after all, what did the Celtic Church have? Just a few local saints. The unhappy King Oswe, brought up by the Iona monks, had always favoured the Celtic Church, but in the face of Wilfred's unanswerable statements, had perforce to find in favour of the Roman Church, and the Celtic party retired gloomily to their distant islands. Many years before this final split in the Church, 
matters came to a head at a meeting between St Augustine and some representatives of the British church somewhere in the area of the River Severn, where, according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, Augustine lacked even the simple courtesy of rising to greet the British bishops. So great was his dislike of the simple Celtic faith. Standing before him in a defiant group, the British bishop said, We know no other master than Christ. We know nothing of the Bishop of Rome in his new character as Pope. We like not his strange customs and will not observe them. We are the British Church, the Archbishop of which is accountable to God and to God alone, having no superior on earth. The spokesman continued in this defiant mood, saying, Be it known and declared that we all, individually and collectively, are in all humility prepared to defer to the Church of God and to the Bishop of Rome, and to every sincere and godly Christian, so far as to love everyone according to his degree in perfect charity, and to assist them all by word and deed in becoming the children of God. But as for any other obedience, we know of none that he whom you term the Pope or Bishop of Bishops can demand. The deference we have mentioned we are ready to pay to him as to every other Christian. But in all other respects, our obedience is due to the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Caerleon, who is alone, under God, our ruler to keep us right in the way of salvation. And so the Celtic bishops and their followers retreated to their islands, leaving the field clear for the promulgation of the Roman faith. King Ethelbert and his queen were both converted to Roman Christianity by St. Augustine in AD 598 at Canterbury, as was the king's daughter, the princess Ianswith, who founded the first convent for women in England. These paintings, completed in the Victorian era, are on the walls of the church of St. Mary and St. Ianswith at Folkestone, Kent. So, although the first flickering lights were going out in the north for a little time, the Christian church in Ireland, founded by St. Patrick, existed for many centuries, free and unshackled by Roman jurisdiction. For about 700 years, the church in Ireland maintained its independence. But King Henry II decided to bring the Irish Celtic church into the Roman sphere of influence. How little he was aware of the gathering clouds of bitter dissension. Accordingly, he called for a council of Irish clergy to meet here at Cashel in Southern Ireland in 1172, an infamous date in Christian church history. The combined influence of the king with the intrigues of the Roman clergy backed by the Pope put a decisive end to the ancient and established church in Ireland which resulted in the seemingly everlasting rift between Roman Catholic and Protestant in that unhappy country, which culminated in the bitterness and destruction in Northern Ireland today, in which there appears to be no end in sight. Reporting from Belfast, Jonathan Charles. Kevin McCracken was shot dead on Monday night. Police said he was trying to ambush an army patrol. This morning, a few hours before the funeral, the IRA issued a statement saying a volley of shots had been fired just off the Falls Road in tribute to him. From the days of St. Patrick to the Council of Cashel, Christianity in Ireland was a period of brightness and simplicity in the teaching of the scriptures. But from the Council of Cashel to our own day, there has been a time of trouble indeed. However, the light, seemingly extinguished for a time in the north and west, was only smouldering, awaiting a new fresh breeze to resurrect it to its former brightness. For it was upon the eve of All Saints' Day, 1517, that suddenly the light burst into life again as Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses onto the door of All Saints' Church, Wittenberg, Germany. During the Dark Ages, a time of spiritual apostasy, the medieval Roman Catholic Church had become deeply involved in a search for political power, which, together with its rapidly increasing wealth and the sale of indulgences, contributed towards bankrupting it as a spiritual force. Martin Luther's surgery cut deep into the roots of this apostasy, 
this perversion of the church's doctrine of redemption and grace. Luther attacked the sale of indulgences and the supposed relics and remains of the saints, naming them perversions of the truth. Reliquaries such as this, containing the supposed remains of St. Martha of Bethany, could only divert spiritual communion away from God. Luther insisted that the Roman Catholic theme of the merits of the saints had no foundation in the Gospels and that justification is by faith and faith alone. The Reformation in Europe expanded rapidly but made no progress in Spain or Italy. In England, King Henry VIII repudiated papal authority and in 1534 established the Anglican Church, which included the Book of Common Prayer. Queen Elizabeth I made no secret of her adherence to her father's desire for a reformed Protestant England and was in grim mood in Parliament when she said to the assembled company, This much I must say, that some faults and negligences are growing within the church, whose overruler God hath made me, all of which, if you, my lords of the clergy, do not speedily amend, I mean to depose you. Look you therefore well to your charges. In today's atmosphere of liberal criticism and believe what you will and the tendency of some senior clergy to explain away the miracles of the scriptures, and everything else which doesn't appear to be in line with the trend of modern thought, perhaps Queen Elizabeth's grim warning might very well apply to these lukewarm shepherds of the people. The relighted Reformation flame will have to be carefully shielded and guarded in face of the rapidly advancing tide of evil, for the evil one knoweth he hath but a short time. The seeds of precious truth scattered by St. Columba and the saints of the early Celtic church had never been altogether lost and only needed to be fanned into flame again. Let us all hope and pray therefore, ere the Lord returns, that we too may return to the simplicity, to the purity and above all to the absolute belief in God's holy word, the scriptures that foundation rock of those early Celtic Chaldees who accomplished so much for so long in such hazardous conditions in those far northern islands to lighten our darkness with that tiny candle flame of faith which later was to burst into the blazing light of the Reformation. At the genesis of planet Earth, in the crucible of creation, God Almighty, Jehovah the Most High over all the Earth, as we read in the 83rd Psalm, made igneous rock. In other words, rock produced by fire or volcanic agency. This awe-inspiring process of creation involves mind-boggling extremes of temperature and astronomical periods of time. The human mind is incapable of comprehending God's measurements in terms of time. Man can but relate eternity with a calendar. Here in Sutherland, in the Dionard Valley near to Cape Wrath in Scotland, is to be found some of the oldest parts of the world's surface. This metamorphic bedrock, that's to say rocks altered after formation by heat or pressure or both, is said to be over 2,600 million years old. It is this foundation material, substantial, ageless, constant and universal, that provides us with our theme. In a sense, stone is a testament in itself, 
an affirmation to a divine creator. Since time began, rock and stone have existed. Ever since the cooling magma became the building blocks of Mother Earth, it has outlived all other substances. By it, we may peer into the dawn of existence, probe inquiringly into ancient history, and make discoveries of great importance. Here, then, is testament in stone. In the Bible, the word stone is used symbolically to represent the nation Israel, and Jesus gave it as a name to Simon, calling him Peter, from the Greek word Petros, meaning a stone. We thus have a nation and an individual chosen as foundation stones in God's purpose for mankind. It is a remarkable thing that during the whole dramatic history of the servant nation, stone and rock have been an identifying feature of Israel, whose God was the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In a temporal sense, we have Joshua's authority to represent the nation Israel in stone. The twelve tribes were commanded to set up twelve stones as a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. In Bible numerology, twelve is a highly significant number. Its numerical value denoting governmental perfection, or rule by God, as the Hebrew words Israel mean. Then take the case of Elijah's twelve altar stones. This statue to Elijah faces the Mount Carmel church built in the vineyard of God, as the words Karim El mean in Hebrew. He it was who gathered all the people near unto him on Mount Carmel and repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Galilean guides claim this to be the region where Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Now, if you read chapter 18 in the first book of Kings, beginning around the 30th verse, you will discover that the fire that fell upon the sacrificial cairn was so fierce that everything was consumed. The wood, the bullock offered in sacrifice, the seeds, the earth and the water about it, even the stones themselves. The stones you see here are said by archaeologists and geologists who gathered them together that they differ from all other stones thereabouts because at some remote time they have been subjected to unusually extreme heat which caused partial calcification. History has left its mark on stone. Cairns and altars testify to the faith of our forefathers. Monuments, engravings and inscriptions bear witness to our ancient past. And as we set forth on our stone trail from Palestine, we should first consider three of the most history-shaping stones that we read about in the Bible. Namely, Abraham's stone of sacrifice, Jacob's stone of destiny, and the stones upon which God gave Israel his laws. In Genesis, we read the account of Abraham's intended sacrifice of his 25-year-old son Isaac. After first building an altar to the Lord, Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But God forbade him, saying, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. What evidences can we muster to turn back the calendar nearly 4,000 years to around 1868 to 70 BC, when the patriarch Abraham, progenitor of the tribes of Israel, manifested his faith in God by this act? Where might one expect to see that rock upon which he offered his son? In Jerusalem is the Dome of the Rock, an Islamic mosque built in the 7th century upon the site of King Solomon's Temple on Mount Moriah. Jewish tradition has it that within the mosque is that very sacrificial rock. To this day, it is known as the Rock of Foundation, and justifiably so, when we recall that upon it was fulfilled the event which was to shape the future for God's servant people for all time. Here we have geophysical rock and a foundation stone of the kingdom nation that was to stem from Father Abraham. It is also said to be the foundation stone marking the then known center of the earth, as maps in the Middle Ages once showed. Indeed, here is one such map as may be seen today in Hereford Cathedral. This is the Mappa Mundi, 
considered by the Royal Geographical Society as a unique national treasure. The point to concentrate on is the circle right in the centre and just above but within the right hand half of what appears to be a letter E lying on its back, so to speak. This is the Mediterranean. The cartographers of around 1300 AD looked upon Jerusalem as being the hub of the world. To Abraham, God made a series of wonderful promises, and these were confirmed to his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, recipients of the great birthright promises never to be rescinded. Beneath this other Islamic mosque at Hebron, some 30 miles or so by road from Jerusalem, lie the human remains of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, together with their wives, Sarah, Rebecca and Leah. Their burial places are in the Machpelah Caves, which lie beneath the brooding walls of the mosque. Within are six cenotaphs, or symbolic tombs. This one marks the resting place of Abraham, the friend of God as he is described in the 41st chapter, verse 8 of the book of Isaiah, the only man ever to be so named. He is also known as the father of many nations. He died in the year 1821 BC at the age of 175. Isaac was 180 years old when he died here at Hebron in 1716 BC and Jacob died at the age of 147 in 1684 BC. There are 2,369 years of history contained in the book of Genesis and it is in Genesis that we come across our other and most divinely decreed stone the stone that was to weigh mark Israel's predestined dispersion. Here, in chapter 28, we read how Isaac's son Jacob, while travelling between Beersheba and Haran, lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. His dream of a ladder set up on earth with the top of it reaching to heaven with angels ascending and descending, has become one of the best-known Old Testament stories. This is no digression, but, just in passing, see how on either side of the west door of Bath's great abbey church, Jacob's dream has been depicted in stone by a 16th century sculptor. Whoever he was, he carved some of the angels upside down, because seemingly he couldn't think how best to show them coming down the ladder. Let us now return to the year 1656 BC and that wonderful dream. Because of the vision he had received, the stone that Jacob had used for a pillow he treated with the utmost reverence. From this moment on it was to enter into the life history of all Israel. Rising early in the morning, he set it up as a pillar and anointed it with oil, a decreed and hallowed form of consecration used in devout form of dedication. And Jacob made a vow and set the stone up as God's house. And the place where this historic incident occurred was called Luz. But Jacob renamed it Bethel, meaning house of God. Here you see it on the map 12 miles north of Jerusalem. So now, as we look toward the hills where Jacob may well have pitched his tent, like those Bedouins you see in the foreground, we might reflect upon this matter of name changing. You remember that God changed Abram's name to Abraham, meaning father of a multitude, since his progeny was to receive the birthright promises. But it was at Peniel that, later, the greatest name change of all occurred, when God gave Jacob the name Israel, meaning ruled by God. To Jacob's grandfather Abraham, who would have known well this rocky ravine, no great distance from Beersheba, God said, I will make of thee a great and mighty nation. I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. And to Jacob's father Isaac, God repeated this promise. While to Jacob himself, who fathered twelve sons, God confirmed yet again that a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. In the Bible, this national birthright is emphasized many times. The new name Israel, given to Jacob, is mentioned 54 times. The nation which sprang from Jacob and the land in which they dwelt 2,064 times. 
and 338 times when referring to the ten tribes carried off into Assyria. This calculation is based upon an analysis of every Hebrew and Greek word in the Bible where the word Israel is used. The chart shows its latter-day identity. Jacob's stone, which we may now quite re correctly refer to as Israel's stone, was to become a stone of destiny. It was to have a very long and much-travelled history. According to biblical data, the children of Israel, with their flocks, spent a long time in the Negev desert, near sources of water. The stone would have accompanied them during their wanderings through the wilderness. This treasured Bethel stone, now a great family inheritance, is said to have been carried into Egypt by Jacob's son Joseph, who became Egypt's great ruler. For 400 years the Israelites were afflicted in a land which was not theirs. At the time of the Exodus, Jacob's descendants, now a great multitude, came up out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses. With the might of God behind him, Israel's greatest leader defied the most powerful monarch on earth to rescue the enslaved children of Israel. God commissioned him to deliver an ultimatum to Pharaoh to let Israel go free. But not until after a series of plagues did the panic-stricken Pharaoh permit the exodus. The year was 1491 BC. The book of Exodus provides the reader with an adventure story without parallel, a journey which defies imagination. When pursued by Pharaoh's chariots and horsemen, the Lord said unto Moses, Lift up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea. And the Israelites went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left and they crossed over the Red Sea in safety. Straight away the waters returned and covered the chariots and all the host of Pharaoh. Entry into the Promised Land was denied to Moses himself because of his disobedience to God by striking the rock when he had been told to speak unto the rock, when the shortage of water brought suffering to the multitude. Many Bible students and commentators maintain that the rock in this instance was the rock of Israel. That is to say, the stone which Jacob had anointed hundreds of years before and which must certainly have accompanied the Israelites throughout their arduous journeyings and which is now recognised as being the coronation stone or the stone of destiny in Westminster Abbey. The two stout rings are of iron but they do not rust. They are greatly worn obviously through long transportation, indicating that it must have been carried on staves over great distances. What kind of stone is this? Here you see the mountains of Moab, lit by the setting sun, with the Dead Sea in the shadowed foreground. In his book, The Land of Moab, Canon Tristram has pointed out that red sandstone, similar in nature to that of the Coronation Stone, is found on the shores of the Dead Sea, not far from Bethel or Luz as it was called in Jacob's day. Let us now leap the centuries to when the stone, after the fall of Jerusalem in 583 BC, where it is said to have been for 1,903 years, was caused by God to go down into Egypt in the custody of his servant, Jeremiah the prophet, because now we see the stone being shipped out of Egypt. By sea, it travelled to a new land, Spain, en route for Hibernia, as Ireland was then called. History reveals that for over a thousand years a continuous succession of ancient Irish kings were crowned at Tara on what now became known in the Celtic tongue as Lea Fael, meaning wonderful stone. In the year 563 AD this symbol of King David's royal line was taken by St Columba, one of the early Christian missionaries to Scotland, to a sanctuary on the Isle of Iona. Here today one may see the burial places of early Scottish kings and chieftains about whom we know so little. The pink granite gravestones mark those silences in history which correspond to the voices of tradition. Dean Stanley in his Memorials of Westminster Abbey mentions the legend that when dying Columba asked to be carried to the stone that he might finish his life's work with his head resting on it. Jacob's pillow once again. Finally, Kenneth McAlpin had it removed to Schoon in Perthshire, 
where he was crowned upon it in 844 as King of all Scotland. As early as 1209 BC, a stone was used at the crowning of kings. In 1296 AD, the stone, which jointly represents Israel of the Bible and the British nation, was brought from Scotland to England by Edward I, who had it placed within this specially constructed coronation chair in Westminster Abbey, where it remains to this very day. Here you see an artist's impression of how the Monastery Abbey and the Palace of Westminster looked in the 1500s. From the reign of Edward the Confessor, 1042, who was last in the line of Saxon kings, for nearly 500 years the Palace of Westminster was the principal residence of the kings of England and also the seat of government. For more than 900 years, Westminster Abbey Church has been the very heart of national events. All, all British sovereigns, with the exceptions of Edward V, 1483, who died at the age of 13, and Mary Tudor, 1553, whose allegiance was to the papacy, have been anointed and crowned upon Israel's sacred stone. The only monarchs in the world to be anointed with oil while seated upon a coronation stone. Few people know that the stone becomes the property of the reigning monarch. It would be a daring man who would contradict the weight of evidence that exists to prove its identity with the anointed stone of Bethel, which at one time was known in Scotland as Lapis Pharaonis, or Pharaoh's stone from Egypt. The oldest relic in British history, it is also our birthright stone. Were you to enter Westminster Abbey by the west door and look closely at the fourth window on the left or north wall, there, right at the top left-hand corner of the Edward I window, you would see the reclining figure of Jacob resting his head upon the stone of Bethel. Recognition of its ultimate destination may be concluded by the fact that the stone is also seen at the base of the coronation chair just to the right of the recumbent Jacob, father of the twelve sons from whom the tribes of Israel descended. The lineal order of the sons of Jacob, as recorded in the book of Genesis chapter 46, when blessed by their father, forms the splendid west window of the abbey. The group of three figures at the top represent, from left to right, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Dividing the window downwards from top to bottom we have, in the centre of the group, Isaac. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Immediately below Isaac is Judah, progenitor of the Israel royal house. Below Judah is Joseph, inheritor of the birthright, and beneath Joseph the royal arms of Britain, containing the motto, Dieu et mon droit, meaning God and my birthright supported by the lion, which is Judah's symbol, and the unicorn, which is Joseph's symbol. From Westminster Abbey, pillar of the Christian faith in Britain, we turn for a moment to the 13th century parish church at Eam in Derbyshire. This is the village that was all but wiped out in the plague of 1665-66. Around the ancient stone walls of the nave, we see some of the original twelve murals representing the symbols of the twelve tribes of Israel. They date from the 16th century. These are the cartouches of Asher and Naphtali. Those of Gad, partly seen on the extreme left, Judah, Zebulun and Issachar are being restored. Even more impressive wall paintings are to be seen in the 13th century Marshland Church at West Walton in Norfolk. In each of the spandrels above the nave arcades are the arms of the ten tribes of Israel. Surely, at one time within these stone walls our Israel origins were preached, since they are so boldly displayed. The lion of the tribe of Judah, and Joseph, from whom stemmed Ephraim and Manasseh, was indeed a fruitful bough by a well. How extremely rare to see such recognition of heritage in any church. It is also lamentably rare these days to see the Ten Commandments displayed, or even preached, in churches. The shame is all the greater when one realises that in these immutable laws lies all the concentrated power and redemptive moral purpose of Almighty God, his written sovereign charter for man. 
How heartwarming, therefore, to see those Ten Commandments on two great tablets of Dartmoor granite stone, opened like pages from the book of Exodus. Buckland Beacon has an atmosphere of Old Testament isolation about it. And standing on this moorland peak, or charter beacon, 1,300 feet above the valley of the Dart, one has a feeling of setting foot on Mount Sinai, where something happened unique in the history of mankind. Let us therefore return to Moses and reflect upon the third of our great history-shaping stones of the Bible. As we look at Rembrandt's famous painting, we must consider the stone tablets, the law-inscribed stones, which Moses brought down from the lonely heights of Mount Sinai, bearing the clear imperatives of God. The Israelites are bidden not to sin because they are commanded to be obedient to Jehovah. But remember what happened. As soon as Moses came nigh unto the camp, he saw the golden calf and the reveling. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands, and he brake them beneath the mount. One can well imagine his fury, after having led them out of Egypt, following years of wandering, having received from their God the law covenant, 430 years after the birthright covenant that God made with their forefather Abraham, then to find them deserting the one and only true God and protector of Israel. In these days of apostasy, we can well re-echo the lamentation of Jeremiah when he said, Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. However, to get back to where we left off, chapter 34 of Exodus opens with God telling Moses to return alone unto the top of Mount Sinai and there to present himself to Jehovah with two new tablets of stone. Upon these the Lord would again write the words that were on the first tablets. And Moses obeyed. The durability of stone may be equated with the durability of the commandments themselves. Here is another ancient manuscript, the Codex Sinaiticus, some 1600 years and more old. It is now in the British Museum. The Old Testament was the Bible of Jesus. God's laws are immutable. In 1859, in the monastery, part of which you see at the base of Mount Sinai, the pink and purple Mount of Moses, or Jabal Musa, one of the most priceless parchment manuscripts of the Bible was discovered. The Codex Sinaiticus dates from the 4th century. This precious possession first found its way into the Tsar's library in St. Petersburg, which is now Leningrad. In 1933, the British Museum bought it for £100,000 from the Soviet government. Therein are contained the laws. Above the advocate's entrance to the Royal Courts of Justice in London, the stone figure of Moses proclaims the fact that the laws of Britain are based upon those given by God to the great law administrator. The Encyclopaedia Britannica, when dealing with English law, states that the law of Moses was the basis of Anglo-Saxon administration. Here lie both the roots and the greatness of a faith without precedent, strong enough to conquer the globe. Significantly, here in the committee room in the House of Lords, Westminster, the highest court in the land, in what is known as the Moses Room, a huge fresco depicts the grand old leader of Israel bringing down the tablets of the law of the Israelites. The Ten Commandments are not laws, they are the law. Man has made over 32 million laws since they were handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai some 3,500 years ago, but he has never improved on God's law. Furthermore, man was expressly forbidden neither to add to or diminish therefrom. The Ten Commandments are the principles by which man may live with God and man may live with man. They are the charter and guide of human liberty, for there can be no liberty without the law. God's laws must be put first in national as well as individual life. The time of Moses has been fixed at between 1520 and 1400 BC. Until recently, certain Bible critics argued that there was no evidence that the art of writing, as distinct from cuneiform inscription, was in existence at that time. But archaeological discoveries in Palestine during the past 30 years have completely rebutted this theory and proved that a Hebrew script was positively in general use at that time. This is the Lachish Bowl, 
a piece of red pottery found in a tomb. The White Sinai Hebrew alphabetical script is said to belong to a period predating Moses. It has been deciphered as reading, His righteousness is my hand. Perhaps the most famous of all stone inscribed texts is the Rosetta Stone of 196 BC, discovered by a Napoleonic soldier in the Nile Delta in 1799. This black basalt slab, inscribed in three different scripts or languages, opened wide the door to an understanding of Egypt's pharaohs, including those who held the children of Israel in bondage. Since the first writing materials were stone and chisel, we might well look at one of the oldest forms of inscribing consonant vowel sounds as separate letters. This system, known as organic writing, can be traced back in this country to remote times as being used by a Hebrew people. Our present alphabet is derived from the Phoenician, which can be readily seen by comparison with the Phoenician writing on the Newton stone. This stone is in the district of Geriok in Aberdeenshire. It contains the symbol known in Denmark as Thor's hammer, or the swastika. Ogham writing was used by the Druids. The Celts, that's to say the Scots from Ireland, crossed to Argyll taking with them their Baal worship and writing around the period 500 BC. If we now return to the Middle East, via the British Museum where these relics may be seen, we may see some of the many clay tablets written to the King of Egypt around 1400 to 1300 BC. These cushion-like tablets are the Tel El Amarna letters. In 1887, a peasant woman accidentally discovered them. They contain correspondence from the princes of Palestine, Phoenicia and southern Syria to the foreign office of both pharaohs. This lackish shard of pottery has upon it portions of a report dealing with military matters. On this small fragment, the name Yahweh, or Jehovah, actually the letters YHWH is written. But perhaps one of the most perfectly preserved war histories, as reported in the second book of Kings, the second book of Chronicles, and Isaiah, is to be found on the six-sided prism of Sennacherib, king of Assyria from 705 to 681 BC. One of the many examples of written records from the great empires with whom the Israelites were in conflict. This baked clay prism contains the annals of the king and his eight campaigns, including his account of how his armies laid siege to Jerusalem in 701 BC. If alongside such ancient inscriptions, carvings and monuments, we place relevant scriptures, then the Bible provides absolute authenticity and incontestable proof. The facts are there for the reading. The tangible evidences corroborate the testaments. In the books of Joshua, Kings, Chronicles, Isaiah and Jeremiah, the frightful battle of Lachish and the siege of Jerusalem is written about at length. Now, see this testament in stone. This mural in the British Museum portrays the great battle. Some 2,650 years ago, Sennacherib had his stone engravers record this moment in biblical history when his Assyrian soldiers armed with assault cars, battering rams, scaling ladders, pots of molten substances, and supported by archers and spearmen, launched their assault on Lachish and the outskirts of Jerusalem. On this second stone slab we observe King Sennacherib seated on his throne, set up amidst vines and fig trees. Officers are reporting details of the fighting around Lachish. Representatives of the defeated people stand and kneel nearby. An inscription reads, Sennacherib, king of hosts, king of Assyria, sat upon his throne of state and the spoils of the city passed before him. What a remarkable confirmation of, and illustration to, the Bible account in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 32. Here's another victory monument. This is the black obelisk of Shalmaneser, king of Assyria and archenemy of Jehu, king of the ten-tribed kingdom of Israel. Strangely enough, this stone column, although set up by Shalmaneser the conqueror, sheds greater light upon Jehu, his adversary, than upon himself. On this obelisk, Jehu is referred to as son of Omri, or Qumri, the Israelites being known to the Assyrians, their captors, as Bit Qumri. This is important because 
now dramatically carved upon the living rock 20 miles east of Kermanshah, near the village of Behistun in Persia, we see an invaluable link which traces the path taken by the dispersed ten tribes of Israel. This great bas relief, carved in the year 516 BC, is written in three languages, Babylonian, Median and Old Persian. The human figures depict vassal princes brought in chains before Darius the Great, among them one of the leaders of Israel. The Persian text mentions the Saka, or Sake, who in the corresponding Babylonian text are called Gimira or Gimirai. The Sakai have now been identified as ancestors of the Saxons, while the word Gimiri or Kimri, as in the Welsh Cymri, is equivalent to the Syrian name Omri, by which the ten tribed Israelites are described on this black obelisk of Shalmaneser. Here then, cut in stone, is evidence that Israel, which was to be scattered among the nations for their constant transgressions and idol worship, was in fact dispersed, but not lost, in God's sight, though lost to the world and blind to their origin, identity and name. Open the Bible again at Deuteronomy chapter 19 and see another scripture come to life. The meaning of the word Deuteronomy is a copy or duplicate of the law. The significance of texts such as this concerning violation of land ownership was not fully realized by early Bible commentators until the discovery of the Babylonian Kaduru or boundary stones. This engraved stone comes from Gula Eresh and dates to about 1100 BC. The biblical landmark was a stone on which were inscribed the extent, boundaries and ownership of property. Engraved upon many of the boundary stones is a curse that will come upon anyone removing his neighbour's landmarks. This, as laid down in Deuteronomy 27, is preceded by the caution, If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, he will be accursed. If we search diligently enough, every passage of scripture will be found to be absolutely authentic, from the smallest detail to events of world-staggering proportion. For example, in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 32, is an account of the building of a water course by Hezekiah's workmen, who stopped the upper water course of Gion, and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. Let us see where that took place. Here is what is known as the Siloam inscription. In 1880, two young lads were playing in the reputed pool of Siloam, and quite by accident one of the boys caught sight of this stone plaque, which, like many a commemorative stone, records the history of the construction. Behold the excavation, it says. Well, let us behold the pool of Siloam, as I read you the remainder of the inscription. Whilst the excavators were still lifting up the pick, each toward his neighbour, and while there were yet three cubits to excavate, a cubit equals about twenty inches, there was heard the voice of one man calling to his neighbour, for there was an excess in the rock on the right hand and on the left. And after that, when excavators pick struck pick, one against another, the waters flowed from the spring to the pool for a distance of 1,200 cubits. That's about 2,000 feet. A graphic description of tunnelers breaking through after working towards each other from either end of the underground tunnel. That tunnel still exists and was used in modern Israeli military operations. By comparison, and exemplifying the other end of the dimensional scale, let us turn back the pages to the Genesis account of the flood in the days of Noah. And it came to pass, after seven days, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Who was it, I wonder, who testified to the deluge upon this stone, the Babylonian version of the flood, found on this tablet in the Royal Library at Nineveh, coincides in almost every detail with the biblical story. A testament in stone that dates from 1700 BC, it tells how God set in motion natural causes on a phenomenal scale for the purpose of destroying a civilization which, after having had divine revelation, ignored its creator and became unspeakably corrupt. Might not history be about to repeat itself, when we consider what the Bible has to say. As it was in the days of Noah, 
so shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. But now we must hasten on by many centuries to a walled garden at the foot of Mount Olivet. These centuries old olive trees could have sprouted from the roots of original stock that were growing at the time of our Lord's agony at Gethsemane. Matthew's Gospel recounts the poignant moment when Jesus, prior to his betrayal, prayed to the Father in an agony of sorrow and despair. Thy will, not mine, be done, he pleaded as his crucifixion drew near. This rock is revered by many Christians as being the place whereon Christ prayed, taking upon himself the sins of the whole world, and thereby fulfilling the scriptures foretold by the prophets. Yet might it not also be regarded as the rock of atonement, since the New Testament makes it quite clear that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins, and atonement is the rock foundation of Christian belief. Somewhere about 1730 years later, when a violent storm broke over Cheddar Gorge in Somerset, a Christian believer took shelter in this cleft in a rock face at Burrington Coombe. The protection the rock afforded so inspired him that he wrote what was to become one of the best known of all hymns. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Atonement through the sacrifice of the crucified Christ is the rock foundation of Christian belief. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And finally, what are we told in Luke's testament? And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end.